let's talk about meiosis. So meiosis consists of two parts. In the first part, we're going to separate homologous chromosomes. Whereas in the second part, we are going to separate sister chromatids. And meiosis has four phases in both of its cell divisions. The first is prophase, and then metaphase, anaphase, and then telophase and cytokinesis. So let's start with prophase one. In prophase one, we have our cell and in our cell, we're going to have pairs of chromosomes. So these chromosomes are being drawn in two different colors, blue and red, because there's a maternal copy and then a paternal copy for each chromosome number. And the cell also has these organelles called centrioles, which have spindle fibers attached to them. Now these pairs of chromosomes are going to be called homologous chromosomes if they have the same genes and are of the same size, but they're not necessarily identical, which means they don't necessarily have the same alleles on them. On the other hand, this would be called a chromosome. And the two strands that consist of one chromosome are called sister chromatids, because they're identical. They have the same DNA, they have the same genes, the same alleles. They are identical. And so let's make sure that we understand the differences between these key terms, between homologous chromosomes, just one chromosome, or sister chromatids. If we're looking at just these two blue strands, this would be called one chromosome. It can either be the copy from a mom or a dad. But both of these together are homologous chromosomes. One would be a maternal copy and the other chromosome would be a paternal copy. This strand and this strand are sister chromatids because they are identical. Similarly, this red strand is identical to this red strand, so they are sister chromatids. This blue strand is identical to this one, and they form a chromosome. And this red strand is sister chromatid to this other red strand. Both of these chromosomes together form a homologous chromosome, but if we chose one copy, either the mom or the dad, then that would just be one single chromosome. I hope those distinctions help you understand the difference between homologous chromosomes just one chromosome or sister chromatids. So let's now look more closely at prophase. Again, this is our cell. And what I've shown here is different from what you see at the cell at the top because there are these crossovers. And this is the exchange of genetic material between a maternal copy and a paternal copy of a chromosome. So these, this is called crossing over, and it is a very key idea in meiosis because it is what allows there to be genetic variation in the offspring. So to define crossing over, it is when non-sister chromatids exchange genetic material. And this forms recombinant chromosomes. Let's now look at the second phase of the first part of meiosis, which is called metaphase 1. And normally in meiosis, we would expect to have crossing over, which is the exchange of material between the maternal and paternal copy of a chromosome number. But just for this example, we're going to suppose that there's no crossing over. So assuming that, let's draw our cell, and in our cell we're going to have our centrioles, which have spindle fibers attached to them. And we are then going to have our homologous chromosomes 
pair up next to each other and line up like this. And what's important about this is that they're lining up along this metaphase plate. So they are lining up along the metaphase plate, but the way that they line up is random. So it's not necessary that a blue chromosome goes to the left and a red chromosome goes to the right. It can be the opposite. We can have a red on the left and a blue on the right. So in the same way in our human body, the chromosomes can line up randomly. But remember, it is homologous chromosomes that are pairing up. So it is a maternal and a paternal copy of a certain chromosome number that are going to be lining up next to each other. So key ideas to note about metaphase one are that homologous chromosomes line up next to each other along the metaphase plate And also, these spindle fibers are made up of microtubules, and the microtubules are connected to a part of cr the chromosomes called kinetochores. So another key idea is that microtubules attach to the kinetochores of the chromosomes, and this is what is going to help pull these homologous chromosomes apart. And so in the next phase, called anaphase 1, these homologous chromosomes are finally going to separate. And remember, we're still going to assume that there's no crossing over occurring. So again, we have our cell. And in our cell, we're going to have our organelles called centrioles, which have spindle fibers attached to them. But notice how this time the spindle fibers don't go all the way. And we're going to have our chromosomes still attached to the microtubules. But notice how they are being pulled to the opposite side of the cell now. So they're not next to each other anymore. They're being pulled apart. So pairs of homologous chromosomes are separated during anaphase 1. But it's also very important to know that sister chromatids are not being separated. So sister chromatids are staying together. It is just that homologous chromosomes are being separated. Sister chromatids remain attached. And now to the final stage of the first part of meiosis, which is called telophase 1 and cytokinesis. So we have our cell again, but this time what you'll notice is that the cell appears as if it's really being pulled apart now. And in both parts of this cell, we still have our chromosomes, but notice how the homologous chromosomes are not together anymore. They are in these two separate cells now. And we still have our central organelles with the spindle fibers. So the cell appears a little different than what it appeared before. And what we're also going to have is we're going to have our nucleus reforming around the chromosomes. Because chromosomes consist of DNA, and the DNA is always stored in the nucleus. So our nucleus is going to reform. But what's really going to help these, this cell break into two different cells is this cleavage furrow that's forming. So we're pinching the cell at the center to form into two. So the final result of the first cell division of meiosis 
is that we have these two haploid cells form, which means that each cell has one set of chromosomes. And that is because the maternal chromosomes separated from paternal chromosomes randomly. But now each cell is haploid. But make sure to keep in mind that sister chromatids have not separated yet. Each chromosome still has its sister chromatids attached to each other. So the goal of the next cell division in meiosis will be to separate these two sister chromatids. But as of the end of the first cell division of meiosis, these two sister chromatids are still attached to each other. And again, we have our nucleus form around the chromosomes in each cell. So now these two cells are ready to move to the next part of meiosis, which is the second cell division, and it starts with prophase 2. So here we have our two cells, and we're still going to have our centrioles, which have spindle fibers attached to them, and this is in both cells. And again, we have our nucleus, which is beginning to break apart now in order to get ready for the next cell division. But we still have our chromosomes in our nucleus, so I'm just redrawing this from the end of telophase and cytokinesis. And remember, again, homologous chromosomes were separated, but sister chromatids still remain attached. And so some key ideas to remember about prophase 2 are that our spindle fibers are going to reappear. And remember, this is important for metaphase when they line up with the help of microtubules, and then also in anaphase when these spindle fibers help pull apart um, the chromosomes. But again, remember, sister chromatids still remain attached. So let's move to metaphase 2, which is going to look very similar from the first cell division. But a few things are different. This time we have two cells. We're still going to have our centrioles, and we're going to have our spindle fibers as well. But again, our chromosomes are going to line up one on top of each other. And remember, the line that they line up along is called the metaphase plate. Now, notice how this is different because this time it's not homologous pairs that are lining up next to each other because we separated those. This time, the chromatids are going to separate. So chromosomes are lined up on the metaphase plate. And remember that we have microtubules that are still attached to the kinetic cores of chromosomes. And this is going to be really helpful in pulling the sister chromatids apart towards toward each pole of the cell. And so now we are ready for anaphase 2. And anaphase 2 is going to look similar to anaphase 1, but again, this time we have two cells, and we still have our centrioles, which have spindle fibers attached to them. So our spindle fibers are shortening because they're being pulled to each pole of the cell. And notice how this time we have our chromatids, sister chromatids being separated. And so note how each 
pole of the cell is getting one blue, one red, and another blue chromosome. And in the cell on the right, each pole of the cell is going to get two red chromosomes and one blue chromosome. So sister chromatids are being separated. And when sister chromatids are separated, then each of those individual DNA strands is called a chromosome. So these sister chromatids are going to move towards the opposite poles of the cell. And finally, in telophase and cytokinesis, the cell is really going to pinch into two. So as always, we have our two cells, but notice how each of those cells appears like it's splitting into two. And so we should expect to get four resulting cells. Each is going to have centrioles and spindle fibers. And this time, each of those cells is going to have a single set of chromosomes. And again, this is because in the first cell division of meiosis, we split up homologous chromosomes, and in the second cell division, we split up sister chromatids. So now we have these four distinct cells, and each cell is going to have a nucleus reform around the chromosomes because DNA is always found in the nucleus, and chromosomes are made up of DNA. And so a key idea to note about the end of telophase two and cytokinesis is that we have four haploid daughter cells that are formed. Remember, they're haploid, not diploid. This means that they have one set of chromosomes only. Also remember that in our examples, we did it without crossing over. But if crossing over had occurred, then we would expect all four of these to be genetically distinct daughter cells. And that is a very key idea about meiosis because we're always going to result with in four gametes that are genetically distinct from each other. This allows for variation in the offspring. So if crossing over had occurred, then all four daughter cells would be different from each other. They would have chromosomes that would be different because we, we would have seen DNA being exchanged. And again, we have the nucleus reforming. So let's now look at all of these steps together. We start with prophase one, and we then move to metaphase one. We're then going to go to anaphase 1, and we're assuming no crossover, telophase 1 and cytokinesis. We then have prophase 2, metaphase 2. Sister chromatids are separated in anaphase 2. And then finally, four daughter haploid cells appear in telophase 2. So here's a summary of some key ideas to note about meiosis. So the first key idea is that in meiosis 1, we're going to be separating homologous chromosomes. But this is different from meiosis 2 when we separate sister chromatids. So remember this distinction because it's very important. The second key idea is that if crossing over had occurred in prophase 1 of meiosis, which it normally does, except in this example we assumed no crossing over, then four genetically distinct haploid daughter cells would have resulted after both, decision, both divisions. And the culminating idea is that these four genetically distinct daughter cells are called gametes. And so in males, we're really producing sperm cells, and in females, we're producing egg cells. So ultimately, in fertilization, we're going to have an egg and a sperm fused together, and we're going to be able to form a zygote. And all of this is because of meiosis.